Hello, my name is Olivia Mattis. I'm delighted that you've joined us today. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Sousa Mendes Foundation. The Sousa Mendes Foundation honors a rescuer, Aristides de Sousa Mendes, who in May and June of 1940 was the Portuguese Consul General in Bordeaux, France. There were thousands, millions of refugees on the roads of France trying to escape. And Sousa Mendes' superior, his prime minister Salazar, had issued an order to all the diplomats not to allow these refugees into Portugal, not to give them visas. So Sousa Mendes displayed great moral courage in defying his government and in rescuing an estimated 30,000 complete strangers. And he paid a very heavy price. So every Sunday for the past two and a half years, we've been presenting stories of rescue and resistance. And today's story is no different. As it turns out, these German Jewish refugees who came to the United States, they felt like they were rescued by these black colleges and universities that gave them a home. What a beautiful movie you've seen today. And we have one of the four filmmakers, his name is Joel Zucker. Um, he'll be speaking to you about the film and some of the stories in the film. We have two eyewitnesses to the story. And we have a poet to talk about the woman who wrote the book that the film is based on. But before we get to our speakers, I would like to pass the floor to today's moderator, Professor Samuel Friedman, who, who is a professor at Columbia University. He's the author of nine books. And about 20 years ago, he wrote an extended review of this film when he was on staff at the New York Times. So he's going to be telling you about today's speakers and Sam, Professor Friedman, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Olivia, and uh, welcome to everybody for what promises to be as exceptional a conversation as the film they'll be conversing about. So let me just quickly um, lay out a few of uh, the practical matters and then introduce our guests. We're going to have time later on for questions, and so if you have a question posted in the chat window, if you mean for it to be answered by a specific person, indicate that. And if it could be any of our panelists answering it, then you don't need to say anything. I'll assume as much. And we'll get to as many of your questions as we can later on. And after I introduce our guests, they're just going to hand the baton from one to the next. So you'll hear from all of them without any uh, interruptions by me. Um, and Olivia will come on when they're done and then I'll moderate the Q&A part of our day. So let me introduce our panelists in the order in which they'll speak. Um, with little memory of his first months of life in a displaced person camp outside of Lubeck, Germany, Joel Suter nevertheless has embodied anti-authoritarian and anti-fascist predilections throughout his 50 plus years of filmmaking providing docu producing documentaries that have probed misunderstood movements like anarchism, looming threats to democracy posed by an unrestrained intelligence gathering, and the important work of the United Nations in trying to keep the world from destroying itself. He's also taken diversions to produce films on his old NYU film school chums. One of them is classmate Oliver Stone, another his teacher Martin Scorsese, and I have to add that one of Joel's earlier films, Friar Abdishtem of the Free Voice of Labor, featured my namesake grandfather, who was involved with the anarchist newspaper that the film is about. James McWilliams, who will speak after Joel, was born in segregated Birmingham, Alabama, and attended Talladega College from 1950 to 1954. Among his professors and mentors were to the German Jewish refugee scholars as seen in this film. While attending the University of Wisconsin School of Law, Mr. McWilliams became active in the civil rights movement. He became a lawyer in the US Department of Interior and later for the Lyndon Johnson administration's war on poverty. 
After then, he was an assistant general counsel for the U.S. Virgin Islands and worked for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. He also served as general counsel for the Opportunity Funding Corporation and was assistant director of public works for the District of Columbia government. In 2019, after that extraordinary career, he retired as a mental health advocate for the city of San Francisco. Um, after Mr. McWilliams, we'll hear from Peter Rasmussen. Peter was born in 1942 to an American father and a German Jewish refugee mother, who as you probably know by now were featured in the film. He grew up in Alabama on the campus of Talladega College, the HBCU where both of his parents were on the faculty. And Peter attended Talladega's interracial elementary school. He received his master's in mathematics education from the University of Illinois, where he went on to develop math curricula. In 1969, Peter moved to Berkeley, California, where he taught at Berkeley High School and formed a math publishing company together with his youngest brother. After retiring in 1995, Peter and his wife, Wei Zhang, spent 25 years collecting and researching traditional Chinese puzzles. Their work was published in two volumes in Beijing in 2021. And finally, E. Ethelbert Miller is a literary activist and the author of two memoirs and several poetry collections. He hosts the WPFW morning radio show On the Margin with E. Ethelbert Miller and hosts and produces, produces The Scholars on UDC TV. And that show received a 2020 Tele Award. Most recently, he was giving a, given a congressional award from Congressman Jamie Raskin in recognition of his literary activism. So in that order from, from Joel to James to Peter to Ethelbert, I turn it over to our wonderful speakers. Thank you, Sam. Um, I mean, the place to begin is the article in the New York Times in 1994 that began this whole process. And I was on vacation when I uh, spotted it. And it was this professor who basically lived nearby to where our office was at that point in Hastings. And he was writing about this book that was just released by uh, Gabriel Edgecombe about, about German professors teaching at black colleges. And you know, right away, I caught my interest because I love this kind of history I've not heard about. But I think that what struck me was the last paragraph in the, um, in the uh, piece. Mutual sympathy is victim of persecution and discrimination united mostly Jewish refugees would barely escape the impending Holocaust with black Americans. The helping hand stretched out by black colleges and black scholars should not be forgotten at a time when alas, Jewish black relations have become strained. I will forever remember in gratitude. Right. So this right away kicked off like, who is this guy? Um, you know, I called my, 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 my business partner, Steve Fischler, and I said, you know, we gotta check this out. And this was at a time where I think that there were a lot of anti-Semitic speeches and Khalid Mohammed was kind of uh, excruciating, you know, Jews. So we basically kind of looked up where this guy was located. He was in Scarsdale, so uh, got a number. But after two or three times when we called the guy, he just like hung up on us because he, he figured we were trying to sell him something. We finally were able to get through to him. And at that point, we met with him. And the next slide was part of the story. And that is, he, he was a student from Dusseldorf. His major interest was political science. And that, you know, he had, you know the handwriting was on the wall. And he had, had, had left for Geneva, was in Berlin. Next slide. Um, and pretty much where he continued his study. And I think he, he basically got his PhD in political science before he, uh, he, he split the uh, situation and came over to the US. And uh, in 1944, the next slide, he was naturalized. However, part of the, his, his, his work here was he, he went to, they both went to work for the OSS, given his German background, his knowledge of what the political situation was in Germany, both him and, and Anna were, were working, you know, uh, heavy duty for the OSS. And in fact, the next slide, you know, Anna is giving a commendation by 
signed by uh, William Donovan, um, who headed the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA. So pretty much he went on in his career, he ended up uh, at Howard University, Ralph Bunch helped bring him to, to Howard. Um, and then he went to uh, City University where he served out the rest of his career. Highly respected political scientist who wrote a number of, of interesting uh, political articles about denazification. In fact, he was in the American delegation that went over to the Nuremberg trials. Which brings us to our next character by the name of Berinsky. Now, Ernst Berinsky is a whole story in himself. I mean, this guy was, is worthy of a feature film. He was a trained as a, a, in the law. He was a judge in Germany. Again, he knew what was coming down with Hitler's rise to power. So he was able to make his way to the United States via uh, a short stint in the US Army as a translator in North Africa. He ended up at the University, University of Chicago where he basically got his degree in sociology. And then he was invited to um, create a department of sociology at Tuckaloo University. Um, he, he created something called the Social Sciences Lab, which the film covers in detail. Pretty much what the Social Sciences Lab did was facilitate civil discourse between members of the white and black community, as well as inviting um, speakers to these, uh, to these, these, these um, events, Ralph Bunch being one. This did not sit well with the powers that be in Mississippi. And the next, as the next slide demonstrates, um, he had created a relationship with the president of Millsaps College, which was a white college. And they agreed to kind of exchange students and whatever. This, as the next slide, indicates was a little too much for what, it, what was called the State Sovereignty Commission. State Sovereignty Commission, which you can see the, uh, their stamp at the bottom of the article, was a surveilling organization dedicated along with the White Citizens Council to make sure that there was no, there were no, uh, there was no outside infection by so-called race agitators, of which Berinsky was labeled a race agitator. Um, the next slide gives you an example of how Berinsky would conduct his, his, his classes. He was a well-respected and beloved member of the Tuckaloo community. In fact, he spent his entire career there and he's buried on the campus of Tuckaloo, which the next slide, that's, that's my business partner, Stephen Fischler. Um, uh, he's there and, and, and he influenced, uh, a lot of people, for instance, Joyce Ladner, um, sociologist who's in the film, they were all kind of, uh, uh, their direction was set by their, their, their relationship with Berinsky. But there were others like, next slide, Ernst Manasseh. Ernst Manasseh was an interesting guy because I think in Sam Friedman's article, uh, he mentioned that we knew about him. He was from Heidelberg University had a degree in philosophy. He had not been helped by the same organization that would help Einstein because when he received his PhD, he was not a professor. So he was kind of cast adrift. What is he gonna do? He came here, the president of this small college, North Carolina Central, James Shepard offered him a job. Had he not been offered that job, he might've been deported back and who knows what would have happened. So he was forever grateful to uh, Professor Shepard for giving him that opportunity. And he, again, he served his entire career out in uh, North Carolina Central. The next slide, Victor Lowenfeld. Victor Lowenfeld was Aust Austrian by birth. He was, uh, he's an interesting guy because he had been, he, he, he had evolved an interest in art therapy when he was very young, especially art therapy among the blind. It was, it, even Sigmund Freud, after having read an article about, uh, about Lewinfeld, visited him. However, when the war broke out and he had to split, he came to the US. He was helped by, a, by somebody in the Department of Education at Museum of Modern Art. 
who also helped him get a job at Hampton uh, University where he created the art department. One of his um, protégés was the well-known, unfortunately passed away, John Biggers, who's in the film. Uh, but the, the Lowenfeld story is very interesting. And I think that, look at the last slides. I, I think that for me, the whole thing sums up the, the, the idea that there are all of these great characters, these ideas which remain, I mean, there's still research Remain, that remains to be done. And I would just encourage anybody out there you know, to Google the names of these professors and their students and get more information. Anyway, with that, I'll hand it, hand it off to, to James McWilliams, who also appeared in the film. Good afternoon. As some of you may know, I was a student at the unique Talladega College, as shown in the film, From Swastika to Jim Crow. I no longer look like that. Let me tell you about my journey, my experiences, and its influences on my life. I was born in Fairfield, Alabama in 1932, near Birmingham, a completely segregated town. All the churches, all the schools, all the houses were segregated. My father, my uncles worked in the steel mills for decades and were not paid equal pay to the wages of the white workers until World War II. When my mother wanted to shop, she would get on the bus to go to the big stores in Birmingham. She would hold my hand very tightly to make sure I didn't quote, sit in the wrong place and get us thrown off the bus uh, worse. When we got off the bus, we had to look for restrooms and water fountains with red for colors only. She could shop in the big stores, but she could not try on the clothes. By 1946, I entered the high school where the principal asked each of us, who among you plan to go to college? Almost none of us indicated we planned to go to college. We had no money. We knew any, no, we did not know anybody who had gone to college. Once you said no, you were placed in a vocational track. I was placed in something called cleaning, dying, and pressing. But by the 10th grade, I met Mrs. Ruth Cook, who taught history. Mrs. Cook was so passionate about her course of history that I got interested in studying and preparing for it. She told us as we entered, she did not care whether we planned to go into the steel mills like our parents or the coal mines or the army. We were gonna learn history. And so I started preparing and speaking up. She noticed that and called me aside and said she was gonna give me additional courses at home and after school and get other teachers to do the same and to put me in the debating society. This lady was so interested in my education, she drove me to this Talladega College, which was 60 miles away and I had never heard of it. She talked the uh, administrators there to give me a scholarship. They said for two semesters. After that, my grades allowed me to keep it until I graduated in 1954. After I began my classes at Talladega, 1950, I realized that some of my teachers were German refugee scholars like Fritz Poppenheim, Eric Nussbaum, and Donald Rasmussen, who was married, as you know, to Laura Rasmussen, a Jewish refugee scholar. These Jewish refugee scholars had been educated at Heidelberg, and they did not care where our educational baselines uh, were. They really wanted to find the base and to take us from there. They created a curiosity to, le to learn and explore, which has lasted me throughout my life. They also introduced me to something called the Socratic uh, technique, where you have to stand up after the professor calls on you and stand until he decides to let you sit. 
this bore well for me when I entered law school where they had the same uh, approach. We also found out that these professors did not feel safe going off the campus because it was not really uh, uh, respected by other white people in the town for what they were doing, teaching black students. But that meant we had extended classes in their homes. And there we learned a lot more than just the classroom uh, book learning. And they learned a bit more about us having grown up in Jim Crow segregated South. These professors also taught me that race was not the only way of looking at things. Coming out of Birmingham, I thought that was the case. White people had all the money and resources, black didn't seem to have anything, so I thought race was the big thing. They taught me that that was just one characteristic, but class was very important. Who had the resources, how they were distributed. And based on that and these notions, that guided me to use my learning throughout my career to try and make life better and to seek justice for everybody. By the time I came back to my second year of college, I realized that McCarthyism, which was spreading across the US had also spread to our little campus. And the president, the white president of the college had been red baiting Poppenheim because he had been a socialist back in Germany. And he had influenced the board of trustees, the white board of trustees, not to give Poppenheim tenure. We students who loved Poppenheim, respected him, and knew that he had done a wonderful job since 1944, were outraged. These white board of trustee members were meeting in the gymnasium wearing their white flannel suits in the hot South where there's no air conditioning, no cell phones. We decided to lock them in. We negotiated by sliding papers underneath the doors and papers came back out. They said, we are not giving Poppenheim tenure. We held them in there more. Finally, they said, as a compromise, we'll fire the white president of the university who got us into this mess. We still said, we want Poppenheim to have this tenure. They said, no, you're not gonna get that. They said, we'll replace Poppenheim economics class with a black economics uh, professor. We said, we want more, you're not getting more. We let them out and I went on to graduate in 1954 drafted into the infantry shortly after that and sent to Germany. After I returned from the army in 1958, while walking around in my hometown, the white police drove up, one driving, one carrying a shotgun. And he said, boy, what are you doing in this neighborhood? And I said, with my uniform on, I used to live around here. Well, didn't they teach you how to say, sir? wherever you were. And what I remember that the infantry taught me how to kill people with my bare hands, with their bayonet, my bayonet or their gun. But I decided violence was not the answer. So I said, sir, to these characters. They drove off laughing. I went home and told my mother what had happened. We both agreed I should get out of Alabama. I left Alabama for Madison, Wisconsin, where I enrolled in law school in 1959. By 1960, black students in the South had begun sitting in Woolworths and were beaten up. My wife, Ann, and I decided to form a Northern support civil rights movement. We brought some of those students to Madison to tell the white students in Madison why they would risk their lives to be treated equally at a, and at a lunch counter. We brought Malcolm X, we brought W.E.B. Du Bois, we brought James Farmer, who was head of core, to the campus to educate the student body. 
After I graduated in 1962 from law school, I began my professional career, remembering the ideals I had learned in Talladega, that I should use my education to try and make life better for everyone. And that's what I've done. And now I would like to introduce my good friend, Peter Rasmussen, whom I first met when I was a Talladega, Talladega student and he was a young kid on the Talladega campus. Peter. Hello everyone, I'm Peter Rasmussen. I'm 80 years old and I live in Berkeley, California. Jim, thank you. And uh, you know, we're neighbors. I live in Berkeley and you live in Oakland but we haven't seen each other except on this Zoom conversation for the last two years because of the pandemic. And, so, that I, and, and because I don't go off the reservation. Yes, yes. and uh, so uh, let's have the first slide. Uh, as you can see, I also went to Talladega College, but I'll talk about that later. First, I'm gonna tell you about my mother, Laura Rasmussen, who appeared in the film from swastika to Jim Crow. Laura was born in 1920 to a Jewish family by the name of May in the small town of Lumpertheim on the Rhine River in Southwest Germany. Her father owned a small department store and the family lived above the store. Although the May family had lived in Lumpertheim for hundreds of years, Jews were not fully accepted by the broader community and were considered outsiders. From an early age, Laura was very passionate about social justice and equality, and this troubled her, as did the inferior status of women and girls in the town's small synagogue. I believe these experiences and those that followed determined the course of Laura's entire life. At school, Laura rebelled against the racist curriculum and the increasing restrictions placed on Jewish children especially after Hitler's rise to power in 1933. She joined a radical, a radical Jewish youth organization, as well as a nationalistic group composed of Jews and non-Jews. Soon her activities attracted the attention of the Gestapo who searched her home and visited her at school. She was expelled from elementary school at 13 and quit high school in Mannheim at 15. However, she continued to study on her own at Mannheim's art, art museums and libraries. By 17, Laura's activities put herself and her family at risk, so, so it was decided that she should leave the country. She barely escaped to France and then came to New York by ship. Meanwhile, Laura's cousin, Fritz Ullmann, who you see her with in the photo, remained in Germany, where he and his parents were arrested in 1940 and executed at Auschwitz in 1942. In New York, Laura studied at Columbia's University for a semester and then transferred to the University of Illinois where, where she received her bachelor's degree. At Illinois, Laura enrolled at, in a criminology class taught by a 23-year-old instructor, instructor named Donald Rasmussen. They got to know each other, fell in love, and married in 1940, the day after final exams. Laura and Don moved to Central Michigan College where Don taught sociology and where I was born in February, 1942. When Don received word that a historically black college in Alabama was seeking a sociology prep professor, he applied for the job. Teledega was impressed with Don's application and recommendations but questioned whether Laura could adapt to living in an interracial enclave, enclave within the black community in the strictly segregated South. Well, Laura had grown up fighting against racism and discrimination in Germany, and both she and Don had been active in the NAACP in Illinois, where they had campaigned to desegregate off-campus housing. So they welcomed the opportunity to work in the South and contribute to the fight for equality and against racism. From Swastika to Jim Crow describes one of their first encounters in the South when they were arrested in Birmingham for eating with a black, 
political organizer in a colored cafe and spent the night in the Birmingham jail. This episode and many others are detailed in Laura's writings, which my brothers and I put online after she passed away. I'll give the URL at the end of my talk. My brother David was born in 1944, and when he reached school age, Laura accepted an appointment to teach elementary education at Talladega. Laura didn't believe in requiring students, neither youngsters nor her college students, to regurgitate facts from textbooks. Instead, she believed in active learning, learning by doing. So she and her teachers to be engaged in science projects, environmental studies, digging up Talladega's red clay and refining it to create works in ceramics and using the college's woodwork shop to construct classroom furniture and teaching materials. Laura even took her mostly middle-class students into the nearby fields to pick cotton so they would have some understanding of the child labor their future students had to perform each summer and fall to help their families survive. Laura also took her students by train to visit and to intern at progressive schools in New York City, the first time out of the South for many of them. Incidentally, the group insisted that the railroad provide non-segregated seating and dining accommodations, and they received it. Our home was the center, was a center of activity with students, faculty members, and visitors often discussing philosophical issues and current affairs around our dining, dining table until late at night. A very frequent, frequent visitor was economics professor Fritz Poppenheim, whom Jim already told you about. He lived next door to us. Laura's best friend, Yvonne Blumenthal, frequently visited us from New York and eventually Fritz and Yvonne married. They were like uncle and aunt to David and me. My brother David and I spent our formative years at Talladega from infancy to grade six and grade eight. And students frequently referred to us as Pete and repeat. We were lucky that the college had its own elementary school, sessions practice school for education majors to observe classes and conduct their practice teaching. All of the children of Talladega's interracial faculty and staff along with others from the surrounding community attended sessions, which saved them from being separated each morning to attend the town's segregated public schools. As sessions, we had the benefits of small classes and advanced studies. Talladega students taught us college algebra and biology. The art professor taught us art. And I even had advanced math tutoring in the office of Professor Eric Nussbaum, another refugee scholar. Outside of school, I could always be found with my classmate and lifelong best friend, Jerry Adams. David and I and our friends had free run of the entire campus and surrounding black community. We often played ball until after dark or went hunting with our BB guns in the nearby woods. Our family had no TV or phone, so David and I could often be found at a friend's home after school watching Westerns. We, also, we always felt safe despite the occasional intrusion on campus by racist cross burners or, or a line of honking cars passing through campus with KKK members in their robes. But these occurrences were relatively few and we never bothered to lock the doors of our house even at night or when we were away. It was always a great adventure when Jerry and I walked the half mile to the town square surrounding Talladega's red brick county courthouse. The courthouse square was always interesting because it divided Talladega's black community to the west from the white community to the east. And so this was really the only place in Talladega where the races came in contact with each other. I remember well one time when Jerry and I walked to the large Woolworths five and 10 on the square. We walked right past the store's segregated water fountains and restrooms because our destination was the large glass candy counter where we would spend a little bit of change in our pockets. 
I'll never forget the curious expression on the young candy clerk's face as she peered down at us and asked, what are you little boys doing here together? Whereupon we looked up and spoke in unison, we're brothers. And that's how we felt. Another time, Jerry and I were down on the square walking arm in arm when an elderly black woman, shocked and very upset, grabbed us and insisted that I go in one direction and Jerry go in the other. I'm sure she believed she was doing this in the interest of our safety. But of course, Jerry and I quickly met again on the other side of the block and continued on our way. The square was also home to the Ritz Theater, which showed first run movies. Our parents didn't allow David and me to patronize the Ritz where blacks were relegated to the balcony at the rear of the theater. However, our black friends were under no such restriction. And I remember how envious I was when Jerry and others came to school one Monday morning, excitedly acting out scenes from On the Waterfront with Marlon Brando. It wasn't until much later in life that I ever got to see that movie. This may come as a, as a surprise, but our lives at Talladega were steeped in culture. We lived directly across the street from the college's DeForest Chapel, which showed excellent second run movies every Friday night. In addition, the college had an amazingly good choir. There were also excellent theatrical performances by students and traveling theater companies. Talladega seemed to be on an informal college circuit for black and some white artists, entertainers, and intellectuals including the poet Langston Hughes, who visited our home on my 10th birthday. A few others I remember are the bass baritone, William Warfield, who starred in the musical Showboat, the writer and social critic, Lillian Smith, author of the best-selling novel, Strange Fruit, the attorney, Thurgood Marshall, who argued the Brown versus Board of Education case before the Supreme Court and was later appointed to serve on the court, Lee DeForest, father of the radio, who invented the vacuum tube and whose own father had once been president of Talladega College, and Ola Tunji, the famous Nigerian drummer who married one of my father's students. Growing up at Talladega provided me with a look at the entire world in microcosm and influenced every aspect of my later life. To this day, I'm grateful for having had the opportunity to be a part of such a caring community and stimulating environment. Now I'm happy to hand the floor to E. Ethelbert Miller. Thank Take you, it away. Peter. Thank you very much. Wonderful listening to you. I'm very happy to participate in today's discussion of the film from Swastika to Jim Crow Refugee Scholars at Black Colleges. The film is dedicated to Gabrielle Edgecombe. She was a dear friend and mentor. She died from lung cancer on May 22nd, 1997, at the age of 76. I met her in the early 70s, what brought us together with our love for poetry. When I met her, she had just published her first poetry collection, Moving Violations. This book was published by Some of Us Press, also known as Soup. Poets like Michael Lally, Terrence Winch, and Ron Morgan were also published by this press. Many of the poets often read at the community bookstore located on P Street Northwest. Gabrielle Edgecombe resided at 2039 New Hampshire Avenue, apartment 702. Her apartment was not far from DuPont Circle. I was often a guest at her apartment. I love being around Gabrielle. I met her before she cut her very, very long hair. And since I was from New York, she reminded me of the type of woman who might live in Greenwich Village, know all the lyrics of songs by Bob Dylan and Joan Baez, and maybe even take a few classes at NYU. Gabrielle was funny. Let me share with you what her poem, Telephone Connection. Every time the telephone doesn't ring, I think it's you. And when it does ring, it's the heart fun. I don't believe in telephone solicitation. It's not as if I didn't know who you are. I just don't have your number. And that's Gabrielle Edgecombe. As you can see, this book was published in the Poets Upstairs, a Washington anthology edited by Octave Stevenson, who was a head librarian of the literature division at Martin Luther King. And it shows that Gabrielle was very much a major part of the literary scene in Washington in the 
um, 70s. In 1978, I was a member of a small group of writers and artists that met in her apartment and decided to put out a, the journal Working Cultures. I believe Gabrielle might have used her own money to bring out this publication. She was responsible for its name, and she worked very closely with the well-known Palestinian artist, Kamal Hulata, who designed the covers. I make reference to working cultures because in her own way, much like the refugee scholars who found work at historical black colleges, perhaps radicalized students that would become active in the civil rights movement, Gabrielle changed my thinking of what it meant to be an artist. In the first issue of Working Cultures, she wrote an editorial statement. Here we find her using the term cultural worker. She defines the task of the cultural worker as follows. To expose is necessary, but not sufficient. We must also exhort, delight, and amuse, and help people to carry on the fight for a new world. I like that Gabrielle included the word amuse. Why fight for a new world if there's not going to be any laughter or fun in it? Gabriel Edgecombe came to the United States in 1936. She was 15. She too was a Jewish refugee leaving Berlin in the at the rise of Nazism. Her own story is as important as the story she would collect for her book. So who was this woman before she wrote From Swastika to Jim Crow? She was the executive director for the Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy. She was public relations officer for the National Welfare Rights Organization. She served on the DC Civilian Complaint Review Board of the DC Police. And what I think is very interesting is that in the early 1960s, she was the information officer with the Volta River Authority in Ghana. The Volta River Authority purpose was to supply electricity for the country. It was very important to the young independent African nation under the leadership of Kwame Nkrumah. Gabrielle Edgecombe never discussed her past with me. She never talked about being a refugee. As you saw, the slides, the two issues of the work journal Working Culture were published, the first in 1978 and the second in the spring of 1984. It was in 1984 that Gabrielle would begin to start working on her book From Swastika to Jim Crow, which was published in 1993 by Craig Publishing Company in Malabar, Florida. One can see that it took a decade of research for her to complete her book. If we look at the book's front and back cover, we see the words, uh, and, and I think the slide will come up, we see the words Aryans only and white only. The front and back covers present a political collage. We see how public space and waiting rooms were segregated. These images underscore the relationship between the Sostwicker and racism in the American South. Gabrielle dedicated her book to her mother. She wrote, in loving memory of my mother, Hedwig Simone, whose courage and wisdom gave me life twice by bringing us out of Nazi Germany in time. The distinguished historian, John Hope Franklin, who died in 2009, wrote the foreword to Franz Swastika to Jim Crow. What he mentioned in the film is what he wrote for the book. A key point he makes is the need to measure or assess the impact of refugees on the, had on the intellectual life of students and faculty at black colleges. I would add three other points that should be examined. One, what did these Jewish scholars learn from black people in terms of Southern black culture and not just a sheer political oppression within a society? Second, how did these scholars resolve the issues of becoming American while observing the conditions of black people living in the United States? And third, Gabriel Edgecombe defined herself as a secular Jew. How many other refugees define themselves this way? And what does it mean to be Jewish in terms of identity, but not religion? Finally, when this film was being made, it was during a time of tension between black Jewish relations. Nation of Islam Minister Khalid Mohammed had given a very disturbing speech in 1993 at Keene College in New Jersey. He would also make disturbing anti-Semitic speeches on the Howard University campus. In 1994, a group on campus led by Malik Zulu Shabazz tried to invite him and was opposed by the then Howard University interim president, Dr. Joyce Ladner. While the students protested around the issue of free speech, Ladner was opposed to having Howard University be a backdrop for anti-Semitic statements and remarks. Ladner, Ladner, it is interesting to note, is in the film we saw. 
She once was a student at Tougaloo College where her life was influenced by Jewish scholars who found employment in Mississippi. Today, we are dealing with something much more serious than the nation of Islam. We are dealing with the rise of white national of a white nationalist party within the Republican Party. Recently, President Biden spoke out against semi-fascists in our nation. The swastika has reappeared along with attacks on our voting rights. The footage in the film of Germany in the 1930s looks very similar to Charlottesville, Virginia, and the Unite the Right rally that took place in August 11 to 12, 2017. One should view the film from swastika to Jim Crow while keeping in mind that a major issue affecting our world today is the issue of refugees and migrants. Wars, gangs, natural disasters like floods and earthquakes have people on the move. Many people are requesting asylum in the United States. How will they be welcome? Who will give them work? When we look around the world today, we might once again cry genocide. When do we say, never again, never again. When I view this film from Swastika to Jim Crow, I not only learn about hidden history, I'm sadly reminded that the present is still a dangerous place to live. And now we're back to Olivia. Wow, I'm speechless from these four stellar presentations. So I invite the audience to continue putting your questions into the chat box. Our moderator, Professor Samuel Friedman, will be consolidating your questions and preparing them. And so to give him time to do that, I'm now going to make some announcements about our upcoming programs. Next week is Labor Day, so we won't be meeting next Sunday. But we'll meet three times in the month of September. And let me tell you about those three programs. It happens that this year, September 11th falls on a Sunday. So we will in fact have a program on Sunday, September 11th. When people think of September 11th, they don't necessarily think, they probably don't think about the remarkable boat lift that happened on that day when a half million New Yorkers were rescued from lower Manhattan by boat. And that's the story we're going to be presenting in a program called Boat Lift. There is a very inspiring short film narrated by Tom Hanks. And we're going to have two fabulous speakers on the panel. That boat lift was the largest such event since Dunkirk in June of 1940. So we're going to have the world's expert on the 9-11 boat lift who wrote a book on the subject. And we're having the world's expert on the boat lift at Dunkirk, who was the advisor on the recent feature film. We're also gonna have some poetry reading to mark the solemnity of that occasion. Now for that program, very unusually, we don't actually require you to sign up. We don't have a way for you to sign up. We will be sending that information to every single person on our mailing list. All 10,400 people on our mailing list will get the link to the film and the link to the discussion, and we hope you'll come. The following week, there is registration required, and that will be on the very important subject of the Vatican and the Holocaust. There's a new film, a stunning film called Holy Silence. We're going to have the filmmaker and um, other experts, and it's a program that's really not to be missed. So uh, there will be tickets required for that program uh, on Eventbrite, just like you signed up for today's program. So that will be Sunday, uh, September 18th. Then that night on PBS, there will be the beginning of a three-part film, a new film by Ken Burns on the United States and the Holocaust, which is going to air on September 18th, part one, September 19th, part two, and September 20th, part three. It's six hours in total. 
we will just invite you to watch as many of it, as much of it as you wish on your local PBS station. And then we have a fabulous panel for you to talk about that film. But since that Sunday is Rosh Hashanah, we're going to exceptionally have it not on a Sunday, but in fact on the Thursday. So we have information on all these programs on our website, and you also will be getting an email after today's program with information about how, how to sign up for the program on the Vatican. So right now we're going to show you a little trailer to the film Holy Silence, and once that's done, we'll get to your questions about today's program. How could it be that millions of Europeans could see the Jews in such demonic terms they'd be willing to massacre little children and old people? For that, I think the, uh, the church bears great responsibility. The Nazis were here in Rome at the gates of his palace. He was a prisoner in the Vatican. What you can do as a prisoner? You can only hope and pray. America is becoming a very important player on the international scene. And the Vatican is seen as a moral voice which could be used against Nazi Germany. The Pope was preparing to challenge Hitler and the entire concept of anti-Semitism he summoned a humble Jesuit from the United States. The Pope has come to symbolize a moral test for the Catholic Church during World War II. What is the point of a religion? What is the role of the Catholic Church? And it's a question for all time. So, Professor Friedman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olivia. And to our panelists, first of all, thanks for those exceptional, exceptional presentations. And a great deal of the traffic in the chat box has been just extolling deservedly what you said. But I'm going to try to pull out a couple of consistent threads from the many questions that were there. And I'll throw these out to any panelists who, who want to take them on. One um, question that was asked in various uh, ways by a number of our guests was what the state of Black and Jewish relations are now in your view, because we're looking back at a time when there was a deep connection between these German Jewish refugees and African Americans, when there was a sense of parallel struggle. So how does that speak to the present state of Blacks and Jews in America or not? And there is a, uh, is a secondary thread of questions, which is, to what degree these German Jewish scholars had sort of lives sacredly or religiously as Jews while they were living and working in largely African-American or Southern white Christian settings. So let me lay those two um, questions out there for anyone who'd like to pick them up, and then we'll see where we are in terms of time. Well, I would say this, just from an observation, looking back in my life, Sometimes the black Jewish conflict that gets projected sometimes might begin in Brooklyn. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, very specific. And it might be Hasidic Jews, you know, against people who are like from Jamaica, you know, Rastafarians or something. Uh, and so what I say that because sometimes that gets blown out of proportion, but because it's in New York, it gets a lot of attention. Also, what happens, I think, um, going looking at what's happening now with attacks like in Pittsburgh, with attacks in terms against voting rights, I think Blacks and Jews see a common agenda, especially in terms of what's happening in, in the Republican Party and, and Donald Trump. So there, there's a closing of ranks around that. And it'll, it'll be interesting to see the type of coalitions that develop around um, the upcoming election, you know, where people see they have a common a common need. And this is where people like, you know, you know, James and others who, who have lived through a period 
as elders, they're very, they're, it's very important to, to make sure that people know this history and, 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 and this bond and, and, and that they carry it into the future. But I think that at any time with any, any community, um, the race relations are tough. You know, I, I've spent a lot of time dealing with the African-American relationship with Asian Americans. You saw we just came through a lot of attacks against Asians. And I'm very much concerned about, you know, how we were dealing with in that community because some of the attacks against Asians were by African-Americans. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And that's what it means if you're an activist, that you be, you're active doing the work. Anyone else from our panelists want to weigh in on that rich question? I think Ethelbert summed it up perfectly. I think totally correct. I mean, I grew up in Brooklyn in the 50s, and Brooklyn was just a series of provincial villages where everybody kind of hated everybody else. I mean, you didn't cross the line if you were in a Jewish neighborhood, you didn't go into an Italian neighborhood, certainly not an Irish neighborhood. And this was going, it went on constantly, you know, until, you know, certain people, you know, when I, as I was growing older, I went to Brooklyn Technical High School, I could see that there were other people, whether they were African-American, whether they were Italian, we had some common interests. So it was a very visceral change that I experienced, but I totally, I'm down with what Ethelbert just said. Yeah, Joe, the only thing the United people in Brooklyn was probably the Dodgers when they played there, but that's another story. <laughs> I used to go to the games, my uncle used to take me. <laughs> Peter or James, do you wanna take that up or shall I go on to the next question? Next question. Okay, Peter, I'll throw one out to us as to you specifically. When you were growing up and were meeting people like Thurgood Marshall and Langston Hughes, did you have a sense of what you, you know, who these people were of their significance? I think I did. Uh, maybe not their full significance because uh, uh, Langston, uh, Thurgood Marshall, for example, um, I had no idea that he would ever be the first black person to serve on the Supreme Court. Uh, but, um, you know, attending their talks and so forth, I, even though I was very young, you couldn't help but be very, very impressed by the intellectual stature of people like Langston Hughes and Thurgood Marshall, and, uh, of course, the uh, phenomenal performances by people like William Warfield and others. All right. Um, there is a question that, um, I think there'll probably be a variety of answers for, but I'll throw it out there, which is how did it work in placing these refugee scholars at black colleges? Who tended to initiate it? Um, or were there different ways in which individual scholars would end up at specific HBCUs? I think that according to um, referencing Gabrielle's research, that a lot of this was happenstance. There wasn't really an organized mechanism to find places for these refugee scholars. It was who you knew. I mean, hers basically references this flat time, somebody you knew who said, you should go see this person. Um, I think the degree of anti-Semitism in the Ivy League colleges was palpable. I mean, you know, if you're Einstein, you get placed. I think a lot of this was total, totally random and happenstance. So then I'd like to uh, shift to what was going to be our next uh, order of business here, which is in the reverse order of the original presentations to ask for summary comments from Ethelbert, from Peter, from James, and from Joel. And then uh, all of you will come on to wrap up. Well, I would place an emphasis on the importance of preserving archives at historically Black colleges, uh, especially the small schools. Um, because there's a lot of history there. It's also very important for these institutions to undertake oral history, you know, interview, you know, people and make sure there's a way of preserving that uh, and then directing the scholars towards this material so that the material is not lost. But I, I find that in many places, especially at historically black colleges, um, the, the funds just isn't there for preservation. Uh, and, 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 and that's very, very important because when we look around and a scholar, you know, comes and they're looking for something, okay, where is it? And in what condition is it? And so that's the type of work that I feel is necessary because if you're, and Joe probably knows, if you're a filmmaker, you know, you need this material. And so the key thing is that, you know, for us to provide, protect it until the filmmakers and the scholars arrive. Thanks, Ethelbert. Uh, uh, I have a couple of comments, um, uh, a comment about my mother. Uh, 
During my childhood, my mother, Laura Rasmussen, she never wanted to talk about her early life in Germany. The experiences were still recent and much too painful for her to recount. But later in life, after her retirement, uh, my father, my brothers and I, we convinced her to transcribe those memories as well as her stories about Talladega, some fascinating stories about Talladega, her work in the community and her, her, her trip to New York uh, with her students and, uh, and also the, the time they were arrested in Birmingham. Um, after Laura passed away, uh, my brothers and I organized her writings and put it online. And we're happy to share them with you now. Um, you can find Laura's writings at the website www.1440-1440-walnut.net. We've learned so much. It's the last paragraph that you see there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Olivia, and all of the other people that uh, organized this meeting. Uh, it's a great experience. And let me pass it on to the next person. That would be Jim. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my um, experiences at Talladega has established my values of respect for all peoples uh, throughout my life. You don't see a picture of uh, me and my current state, but my wife, Anne, and I are members of a, uh, uh, there I am with the kente cloth. We are members of a choir called Vukani Mawetu, which means people arise in Zulu. This choir was started by an exile from South Africa's apartheid time. And he taught us songs in Zulu protest songs, and this choir has been going on for the last nearly 40 years. We also had the honor of visiting South Africa where uh, uh, President Mandela loved to hear us sing these songs and gave us private time together. So that's what uh, we are doing now, days, except that with the pandemic, we can only get together by Zoom and not actually sing. This is another way that I have put into practice the values I learned at Talladega. And Joel, I think the last word goes to you. Well, thank you. I'm just like blown away to be on a panel with, with people like Ethelbert, you know, Peter and, and James and listening to those stories. It just makes me, uh, it convinces me that not only do you need to recover history, this kind of history, you need to continue to defend what lessons we've learned or not learned. I mean, I think impending, and I tell my kids this too, both of them are lawyers. I mean, you know, you turn your back for a minute and you're gonna have fascism as a way of creeping up and basically stick getting that clause into people. Oh, we need a leader. We need somebody to tell us what to do. We need to have somebody who outlines an agenda that we can identify with. That's a problem and it will continue to be a problem. So I think it's okay to be a filmmaker. I've been a filmmaker for a long time, but I think it's better to be an activist using film to uh, inspire and educate. And I'm just, now let me just point out that this, is, this was a team effort. This is my, my, my Pacific Street partner, Stephen Fischler, but there was also director, directors, Lurie Cheadle and Martin Tao. who need to be um, referenced. And boy, you've left us with such an incredible document, a testament to this story. And I wanted to thank you for that. So uh, thank you to our moderator, our wonderful moderator, Professor Samuel Friedman, and to our fabulous panel. One of our panelists, let me just point out, Mr. Jim McWilliams, we were looking for an eyewitness to the story. And guess what? He's been attending the programs of the Susan Mendes Foundation for many months with his wife. He was yes. in our audience. Right. So I wanted to encourage any of you out there who have stories that we should feature, please be in touch. And have a terrific uh, Labor Day weekend, everybody. And we'll see you in September. 
So be well. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks for putting this together. All right. Thank you.